I'm going to show you how to do the A-level physics practical, verifying the first harmonic equation for a stationary wave on a piece of string. This might be the first required practical that you do in year 12, and it is a little bit of a complicated one, so it's a little bit of a baptism of fire. The setup is fairly easy though. What I have is a signal generator connected to an oscillator, so that's just going to set the string vibrating, and I also have it hooked up to my CRO, my cathode ray oscilloscope. That's gonna allow me to measure the frequency accurately. I also have my pulley over here. The string is going over that, and we have a hanger and some masses on the end of the string, which is providing the tension in the string. Now, if I turn my oscillator on, you'll see that I now have a stationary or standing wave on my piece of string. This is the first harmonic, it's the simplest standing wave that you can make. We have a node on either end, that's where the string isn't moving. Okay, the string is moving at this point due to the oscillator, but we don't have an antinode, we don't have constructive interference happening at that point. What's going on in the middle? Well, the wave traveling to the left and the wave traveling to the right that's being reflected from the pulley, they're meeting all along the string and these two waves interfere. That means that their displacements at that time add up. And what we have here is constructive interference in the middle, two nodes on the end and an anti-node in the middle. That's where we have the biggest amplitude because constructive interference is happening there destructive interference at the node. It's where the displacements always add up to zero. Now, what we want to do is find out what frequency is needed to make this first harmonic stationary wave on the piece of string. And the equation for this is F equals one over two L times the square root of T over mu. Now that might seem a little bit complicated and that's why this experiment isn't the easiest, but let's break it down. F is the frequency of the wave, L is the length of the piece of string, and you are gonna to want to measure that and make sure that that doesn't change. Mine is exactly a meter, which is a good, nice round number to go with. T is the tension or the force on the piece of string, and that is being supplied by the force of gravity on the masses on the end of the piece of string. And so that means that we can actually replace T with mg, and that's mass times gravitational field strength. That makes it a lot easier to analyze later on. Mu is the symbol that people often forget. It's mass per unit length, kilograms per meter. What we're gonna do is get mu from our experiment and then actually check it against the real value by putting this piece of string on my balance here. Now what we're gonna do is change the mass on the end of the piece of string and therefore changing the tension. And we're gonna see what frequency is needed to create a standing wave then. Now one of the problems is that the fundamental or the first harmonic is a little bit tricky to spot. It's not exactly clear when you have the first harmonic. So a nifty little trick is to actually go for the second harmonic. And then the frequency of that is gonna be double the frequency for the fundamental first harmonic. All we have to do is half our answer at the end. So let's try and get the second harmonic. So I'm increasing the frequency on my signal generator. And there you can see we have the second harmonic. We have not two nodes, but three. One, two, three. Two anti-nodes, one here and one here, where we have constructive interference. Right here, just destructive interference. The displacements always add up to zero. It's not gonna be perfect, but it's pretty good. I have 40 grams of mass on the end of my piece of string, and I'm gonna be going up in 40s all the way to 200 grams. You don't wanna put lots of mass on your piece of string, otherwise the oscillator doesn't work, it might actually break. So I go with 200 grams tops. So I have my second harmonic. Now I need to find out the frequency. I'm gonna use my oscilloscope to do that. So let's have a look at the oscilloscope. We can see that we have one complete wave. If you don't have one complete wave, you'll want to change your time base to make it shorter or longer to make sure that you don't have lots of waves, you don't have half a wave or a quarter of a wave, but about one and a half waves. That means that you get the most accurate readings. So if you haven't used the CRO before, it's basically just a voltmeter that shows how the voltage is changing over time. So whatever is going on here is also being reflected in the oscillator. Now, we don't care about what the actual voltage is. We're just looking at the time. So you can move your wave around up and down, left and right to make sure that you get a nice reading. So I've moved it so the peak of my wave is now lined up with this line here. Now we wanna know how long in seconds one complete wave is. So let's count the squares from peak to peak. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to say that that is 7.4 squares. 
to turn that into an actual time, we need to look at the time base. Over here, we can see that each division, that's each centimeter, each big square, is 10 milliseconds. So that means that 7.4 squares times 10 milliseconds, that means that our time period is 74 milliseconds, or 0.074 seconds. Now to turn this time period into frequency, time period is seconds, frequency is hertz, or per second, so that means that they are reciprocals of one another. Frequency is one divided by the time period, so one divided by 0.074, and that gives us 13.5 hertz. Now on my signal generator, I can see the dial says about 20 hertz. My signal generator is quite a bit off. You can't trust a dial on a signal generator. Use an oscilloscope to measure the frequency accurately. If the frequency for the second harmonic is 13.5, then we're going to half that to get to the frequency of the first harmonic, or the fundamental. But we can't go to a greater precision than two significant figures, and so we're going to say that that's six, 0.3 hertz. What I'm going to do now is add 40 grams to my hanger to make it 80 grams altogether and then see what frequency is needed to make the second harmonic this time. So I've added my 40 grams and we can see that we don't have the second harmonic anymore. So we're going to have to turn up the frequency to get that second harmonic again. And there you go. So looking at my oscilloscope now, I can see that the time period has decreased because the waves are more squashed together. So you're just gonna keep on adding 40 grams and measuring the frequency needed to make that second harmonic, halving it to get the first harmonic every time. So my data looks like this. I have the mass that was on the end of the string. I've converted that into kilograms because we need to do that if we're gonna do some analysis. And I have my frequency of the fundamental. That's the first harmonic. Now let's have a think about the original equation. F equals one over two L times the square root of T over mu. Now because the tension is inside that square root, we can see that the frequency is not gonna be directly proportional to the tension, and therefore it's not gonna be directly proportional to the mass that we have on the end of the piece of string. However, if we square the whole equation, we have F squared equals one over four L squared times mg over mu. Now because L, and mu and g are constants, we can say that the frequency squared is proportional to the mass. So if we drew a graph of f against m, we wouldn't get a straight line. We don't have that proportional relationship. However, if we draw a graph of f squared against m, we do end up with a straight line like this. Now we need to find the gradient of our line. That's always the case in these practicals. And this ends up being, for me, 1,215. Now the gradient of a graph is calculated by the change in whatever's on the y-axis divided by the change in whatever's on the x-axis. So it's gonna be f squared divided by m. Looking at our equation, if I rearrange it to get f squared divided by m, I end up with g over 4l squared mu. Seems complicated, but we're nearly there. So if f squared over m is equal to 1,215, that means that g over 4l squared mu is also equal to 1,215. Now that we've done that, we can actually check whether we have the correct value for mu or not. All we have to do is swap around the gradient and mu, and we end up with mu equals g over 4l squared times the gradient. What's that gonna be in numbers? 9.8 divided by four times one squared times the gradient. So just 9.8 divided by four times 1,215. And that gives me 0 0.0020. The unit of this is kilograms per meter. Converting it into grams per meter, that's two grams per meter. So our data is telling us that the mass per unit length of the string should be two grams per meter. Let's see if that's true. All I'm going to do is cut my piece of string where it reaches the pulley and where it comes off the oscillator. Putting the string on my balance, I can see that a meter length of this string has a mass of 1.6 grams. So that means that our two grams per meter is slightly off, but that's okay because we're always gonna have uncertainties and an error in our experiment. That's just the nature of experiments. What we can do is calculate the percentage difference between the two values. What we do is take the difference between the values that's two take away 1.6 divided by the actual value, 1.6 times 100. And that gives us 25%. 
we have a 25% error in our calculated value for mu and the actual value for mu.